We are reading the book, Listen, God is Calling. The first chapter discussed the split most of us experience between Sunday and Monday. That is, why we do not experience more of a connection between the Sunday church activity and what we do the rest of the week. We are now on chapter two of this book, entitled, How the Split Came to Be. This chapter attempts to identify the factors that contribute to this disconnect between our church activity and our daily work activity, even among the most committed church members. This chapter explores these factors in sections that look first at our understanding of the purpose and meaning of work itself, then some societal factors that mitigate against relating our faith and our daily work, and finally the way the church has been complicit in this Sunday-Monday split, sometimes actively involved in encouraging it. First, the purpose and nature of work. In Western culture, our daily labor is a main provider of work, of worth for most adults. A person's job title, security, and salary grade are important measures of value in our society. Not necessarily the value of our work per se, but work as a means to accumulate material wealth as a status symbol. In ancient Greek thought, manual labor was particularly considered degrading. Work was seen as a means to rise above work, to escape the need for it, and to spend one's time in contemplation. A, a direct result of this Greek attitude was the medieval church's elevation of the contemplative life as somehow better than manual labor. The Greeks and monks may have escaped into contemplation, a more modern look at escaping from the evils of work, or escaping after work in, is done is the goal of leisure. We work in order to have leisure time. When I was in college as a Jesuit scholastic at Loyola University, I read a book I still remember major parts of, Leisure, the Basis of Culture by Joseph Piper. Only when our work is done can we relax and enjoy the quiet moment, the moments of leisure. These quiet, reflective moments are the basis, in Piper's book, of religion and philosophy, of culture. Two quotes from this book. The ability to be at leisure is one of the basic powers of the human soul. Like the gifts, gifts of contemplation, self-immersion in being, and the ability to uplift one's spirit in festivity. The power to be at leisure is the power to step beyond the working world and win contact with those superhuman life-giving forces that can send us renewed and alive again into the busy world of work. And again, today in our culture of productivity fetishes, fetishism, we have succumbed to the tyrannical notion of work-life balance and have come to see the very notion of leisure not as essential to the human spirit, but as self-indulgent luxury reserved for the privileged or deplorable idleness reserved for the lazy. And yet the most significant human achievements between Aristotle's time and our own our greatest art, the most enduring ideas of philosophy, the spark for every technological breakthrough, originated in leisure, in moments of unburdened co contemplation, of absolute presence with the universe within one's own mind, and absolute attentiveness to life without. Be it Galileo inventing modern timekeeping after watching a pendulum swing in the cathedral, or Oliver Sacks illuminating music's incredible effects on the mind while hiking in a Norwegian fjord. As striking as Piper's argument is that religion and philosophy, and indeed culture itself, came from leisure time, he is also in this line of thinkers who seem to denigrate the, the value of work itself. Later in our book, Listen, God is Calling, the author will invite us to explore how, how Martin Luther's thought on vocation might lead us to honor our work life and see it as a way to link again our Sunday and Monday activities. 
What is your daily work? Is it fulfilling? What parts of it seem like a blessing or a curse? What are the connection points in your work between your identity as a worker and your identity as a child of God and member of St. Mark's? The second set of factors that contribute to the disconnect between Sunday and Monday are societal and cultural factors. The author notes that for many in our society, religion and home and family are considered part of our private lives and we keep these separate from our work lives. This is particularly true in our, plural, in our pluralistic society where we keep our personal beliefs private in order to avoid tension or disagreement. The complexity and rapid pace of our work life leaves little time for reflection on any deep meaning. And finally, the materialism that drives much of our 20th century life might lead some to think that trying to find meaning or purpose in serving some higher good just makes you a sucker in the competitive work world. To what extent do you compartmentalize your life? Is family and home and church completely separate from your Monday to Friday work life? How could St. Mark's help to connect these parts of your life? Or do you see that as important? The final factor that leads to the Sunday-Monday split is the complicity of the church in propagating this split. Part of this is in the nature of the institution itself to be inward focused. And part of it is in how lay people have been valued and in contrast, how pastors have been placed in an elevated status in the minds of church members. The author quotes William Deal, who suggests that we can find evidence of how the church falls short of promoting the connection between church and work life in four areas. For what and for whom does the church pray? For whom does the church offer support ministries? For whom does the church offer training? And for whom does, the church, whom does the church recognize and honor? And then in the final section of this chapter, the author begins to explore how we can develop a new vision for the church where God's people will understand their daily tasks as having meaning and value beyond their role in securing a paycheck, even if these tasks are not the source of all meaning. Pastors and other church leaders will have a role in this, but so will all of us as church members if we are to be successful in emphasizing this rhythm of gathering and scattering. And some final reflections on the nature of work and seeing our life as a vocation. The Jesuit notion of work and ministry and vocation is similar to Martin Luther's in some ways, and both stand in contrast to the hierarchy of thinking that meditation and contemplation is somehow more holy than manual work. The Jesuit motto is ad maiorem dei gloriam, all things to the greater glory of God. Rather than start another religious order that was cloistered and contemplative, Ignatius structured the Jesuit order around contemplation in action. The idea is that rather than going away from the world to pray, and use the, one could enter into the world, engage in many forms of work, and use that work itself as a form of prayer. Do whatever you do earnestly, as perfectly as possible, and give glory to God by the work you do. Contemplation in action. So you see many Jesuits engaged not only in missionary work and in teaching, but working as astrophysicists, physicians, psychotherapists, community organizers, and even holding elected political offices. I think there's a strong connection between the Jesuit focus here and what we find in this book and Martin Luther's teaching about vocation. But as I thought further about it, I realized there is still a significant challenge in getting all of us at St. Mark's to see our daily work as God's call. Jesuits emphasize contemplation and action and doing whatever you do for the greater glory of God, but I do not remember any Jesuit spending his time waiting table or collecting city garbage or working in an Amazon warehouse. So the challenge of this book and the challenge before us at St. Mark's 
in this focus on vocation. How do we as church members and leaders alike get every one of us, regardless of what we do Monday through Friday, to see the work we do as furthering the kingdom of God, serving God's children? And how do we see our worship and church activities at St. Mark's as a way of sending us out into the world, not as an opportunity to shelter us and remove us from our work in the world?